It's my pleasure now to invite none other than the most beautiful lady, Ms. Indrani Raja. May we invite you on stage for your keynote address, please. Ambassador Gopinath Pillay, Chairman of Institute of, Southeast, of South Asian Studies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start off by wishing everybody a good afternoon and to say what a great pleasure it is to be able to be here with you today. The relationship between South Asia and Singapore is long-standing, stretching back centuries when the first traders came to the region. Today, we have strong relationships on many fronts through our growing economic ties, regular political interactions, and people-to-people -people exchanges. Today's convention is an excellent platform to discuss the topics that the ISAS has outlined, and I hope that you will all gain new insights from these discussions. The topic of this next plenary session, Women Empowerment in South Asia, is an important one. It involves issues that have significant societal and economic impact. These issues are not unique to the region, but they are certainly of pressing significance. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report last year, the South Asia region had an average gender gap of 34.2% in 2017, with room for further development. Behind these figures, or behind this figure, are some challenges that the region faces. One example is the low labor force participation of women. According to the World Bank, the fraction of working age people who are at work has fallen for a number of countries in South Asia. For these countries, the fall in employment rates has been particularly marked for women. Looking beyond the Global Gender Gap Index, there are reports that indicate that South Asia is also grappling with gender-based violence. Some challenges do go beyond the women population. For example, low participation in education by both boys and girls and student retention rates. According to the UNICEF, about 11.3 million South Asian children at primary level and 20.6 million at lower secondary school level are not in school. In addition, South Asia has the highest attrition rate in the world for basic education, and many do not achieve minimum learning benchmarks in literacy and numeracy. There are also other issues that need to be resolved, such as inadequate numbers of quality teachers, among others. These issues are not easy to address, but there has been progress. Between 2000 and 2017, South Asia achieved the greatest overall percentage reduction in maternal mortality rates, from 395 to 163 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Countries like India have introduced legal provisions to stimulate female labor force participation. Measures include penalizing discrimination against women and providing paid maternity and childcare leave. Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan have also made headway in political participation of women, Bangladesh for its reserved seats system, India for having significantly more female representation in its local governments, and Pakistan for its requirement for at least 10% of voters in each constituency to be women for an election to be valid. The question is, what more can be done and how countries can advance in the shared goal of eradicating these problems. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, and each country has to devise strategies and solutions that are relevant and suitable for their individual circumstances, culture, and situations. On this note, I would like to share Singapore's own journey. From the outset of independence in 1965, we took a very definitive stand with regard to gender equality and the status of women, 
and address these in our laws and policies in relation to education, labor participation, women's leadership, and the protection of women. Our underlying premise is that every citizen, male or female, adult or child, is precious to us, and we must help them reach their fullest potential. We have no specific gender equality or anti-gender discrimination legislation in Singapore, but the Singapore Constitution provides that all persons are equal before the law and entitled to the equal protection of the law. And we promote equality through the application of our laws and policies. Where necessary, we take steps for the advancement of women, both through legislative and non-legislative means. We have achieved progress over the past decades and have had many positive results. Singapore has a high literacy rate for women, that is 95.9% in 2018. In 2018, 48.5% of our graduates were women. In 1995, the, lab the female labor force participation rate for those aged 25 to 54 was 58%. As of last year, it has grown to 80.8%. Last year, Singapore was ranked first in the World Bank's Human Capital Index. There is still much more that we need to do, but let me share how we have come this far. The legal status of married women before our independence may surprise some of you. There used to be a common law doctrine of unity of legal personality, which provided that the married woman's personality would merge with her husband's. In practice, this meant that the husband's legal pers personality remained intact, but the married woman lost her legal capacity and had to request her husband to carry out legal acts on her behalf. The only flip side of this doctrine was that women at that time didn't have to pay income taxes. But women at that time, especially married women, enjoyed few forms of legal protection. On achieving self-government, we introduced the Women's Charter. The Charter effectively provided for the protection of women. It regulated polygamous marriages, clarified that married women were capable of owning their own property, provided for what would happen in a divorce, and strengthened the laws relating to offenses against women and girls. We also have many other laws that protect women from violence within and outside of the family context. For example, the Penal Code provides protection for all persons from hurt and sexual assault. There are also other laws which, while equal in application, by their nature, afford greater protection to women. One such example is the Protection from Harassment Act, or POHA, which we enacted not too long ago, just a few years ago, in fact. While it protects all persons from harassment and other related antisocial behavior, the protection afforded by the Act benefits women in particular because women, more so than men, are often the victims of harassment. POHA covers a wide range of conduct, including sexual harassment, stalking, and cyberspace bullying. The Act criminalizes harassment and provides a range of self-help and civil remedies to victims. More importantly, there is strict enforcement of these laws. Having laws alone is not enough. Carrying them out and having a fair and just judicial system that upholds the importance of protecting more vulnerable members of society is also a key factor. Societal education, too, is important. Under the Women's Charter, the Family Court may also order individuals affected by violence, that's victims, those who abuse, and other family members, to undergo mandatory compulsory counseling to address their issues, such as anger management. A lot of work is put into helping men who are abusive to not only understand why it is wrong, but to come to grips with the underlying issues that drive them to violence. Considerable effort is also spent on raising awareness on family violence and equipping everyday Singaporeans 
with the resources and skills to step in to help victims if needed. This is done through multiple platforms, such as television, print articles, campaigns, roadshows, as well as government agencies, working closely with non-governmental agencies and the wider community. Next, education as an equalizing force. On the educational front, we made education available to all students, both male and female, and from very early on, actively encouraged school enrollment. Thus, even though the Compulsory Education Act was only introduced in 2000, enrollment in school was generally high even before the Act came into force. Next, our policy of meritocracy. That's the policy which stipulates that places, jobs, or roles are awarded based on merit and ability, and this has ensured that our female students and women have and continue to have equal access and equal opportunity in education and employment. Through our, ed our educational policy of holistic development, every child is encouraged to develop his or her fullest potential, not just academically, but also in the arts, sports, and vocational pathways. Girls are often underrepresented in STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and math. We work to remedy this, in addition to ensuring STEM subjects are available to all, the Singapore government has introduced computational thinking and compulsory coding classes for both boys and girls in the upper primary levels. In so doing, our aim is to act early to eliminate potential digital gender gaps. Not only does introducing coding to girls at a young age dismantle stereotypes, it can further expand a girl's education and career options. In recent years, we have also progressively enhanced the quality, accessibility, and affordability of early childhood education to ensure that no child, male or female, is left behind. Next, women's health. Our low infant mortality rate at 2.1 infant deaths per 1,000 resident live births and maternal mortality rate of 10.8 per 100,000 live and stillbirths are among the lowest in the world. And this reflects the focus we have put over the years on addressing the health of our women and children. This has been done through public health initiatives and the improvements in areas such as medical care, education, and nutrition. For pregnant women in Singapore, prenatal care provides a good start for a healthy pregnancy and helps manage the potential long-term health benefits on the child. For example, new guidelines were introduced last year to recommend screening for gestational diabetes to all pregnant women in Singapore, and not just those with high-risk factors. In Singapore, breast cancer is the most common cancer among women, accounting for almost one in three cancer diagnoses among women. To reduce the mortality from breast cancer, a national breast cancer screening program Breast Screen Singapore was set up in 2002 to raise public awareness and to encourage early detection. Many primary school students in the 1970s to 1980s in Singapore were undernourished. To improve their nutritional intake, a milk program was introduced in schools where underweight students and those from needy families would receive milk free of charge. The others could buy milk at reduced prices. Since the 1970s and 80s, vaccination against diphtheria and measles has also been made compulsory for children as part of the National Childhood Immunization Program. On to empowering women with choices. Women play multiple roles in Singapore society. They are daughters, wives, mothers, members of the workforce, and leaders, to name just a few of the many roles they play. To enable women to fulfill these many roles, we try to empower them with choices to pursue their aspirations. One area in which women in the workforce constantly struggle is the balancing of work and family responsibilities. We provide support through maternity leave provisions where working mothers are generally entitled to 16 weeks of government paid maternity leave and childcare leave. Promoting the value of shared parenting and equal partnership in the family is another important aspect. 
One of the ways in which we've tried to do this is by enhancing leave provision for fathers so as to change traditional mindsets and encourage fathers to be involved in caregiving. Women generally tend to be the caregivers, both for the young, children, and the elderly. We have therefore ramped up childcare and elder care services, thereby giving families, and the women in particular, more support so that they can pursue both their career aspirations as well as fulfill their family responsibilities. We're also promoting work-life initiatives, such as the flexible work arrangements for flexi-load, flexi-place, and flexi-time. From March this year, more companies would be able to tap on government funding to adopt flexible work arrangements and family-friendly family practices. There are also equal opportunities for men and women to be in leadership positions. Under Singapore's labor laws, there are no restrictions on women joining trade unions or holding office in the union. Neither do you, our unions adopt discriminatory policies or practices to restrict women's participation in leadership positions or in the decision-making process. Women are encouraged to join the workforce and are valued for their contributions. Political parties in Singapore consciously and continually seek suitable women candidates. We too have made steady progress on women's representation in politics. In the 1960s, women occupied only three out of 51 seats in parliament. There was a period in the 1970s where there were no women members of parliament at all. However, in the current parliament, women occupy 24 out of 101 seats, which is about 23.7%. We can certainly do better, but on an international level, we aren't doing too badly. This percentage is in line with the Interparliamentary Union's world average of 24.3%. We now have seven women political office holders, of which three are cabinet ministers, and we hope that there will be more. In January 2013, Madam Halima Yaakob was appointed the Speaker of our Parliament. She was the first woman appointed to such a position. In September 2017, she was elected the President of Singapore, the first woman to occupy the post of Head of State. The public service and the judiciary also practice the principles of equal opportunity and meritocracy. This applies to the selection for talent and leadership development programs, as well as appointments to leadership positions. What about the corporate sector? A number of studies have shown that companies with more diverse boards tend to make better decisions and perform better. Gender diversity on the board is one of the ways to bring in a variety of perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences so that companies can address their workforce and customer groups better. Currently, women remain underrepresented on boards and in senior management positions of companies in Singapore, but we are seeking to improve this. The Diversity Action Committee, or DAC, was formed in 2014 to build up women's representation on boards of companies in Singapore and expand the pool of women ready for board appointments. This year, the DAC was renamed the Council for Board Diversity, with President Halima Yaakob as the Council's patron. The Council has widened its scope from increasing the representation of women on boards of the Singapore Exchange listed companies to include organizations in the people and public sectors. The target for women's representation on boards of SGX listed companies to reach 20% by 2020, 25% by 2025, and 30% by 2030. At the grassroots and community levels, there are many women's committees and active groups which serve women's causes and activities to promote women's well-being. These are actively encouraged. So, we have not solved all gender issues here in Singapore, and we have our fair share of challenges. However, we have made great strides from where we first started on our journey as an undeveloped nation in 1965. And the reason for the progress that we have made through the years derives solely from one fundamental tenet, which is that we value our women, just as we value others in our society. When you value people, the rest will follow. 
So thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak with you today, and I wish you all a fruitful session and for our overseas visitors, an enjoyable stay in Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs>